See ya. Oh yeah. Okay. I need to get good. <laughs> Not sure. Okay. Um, this is gonna be the opposite of my lecture. I guess we spent an hour. On your election was get your lecture was get bad. Um, no, my lecture was like the imposition of getting good is ah uh, yes imposition of the social construct, <laughs> modern logistics and racial capital. Okay, hold on. Sorry, I need to probably figure out if you all are here. Realism. All right, we got Annie and Nora. Luke is in quarantine. Is that right? He's not on the Zoom. Nietzsche, Kabir, Carson Bates, okay. Robbie Parikh. Yeah. Uh, Kylie Kim, uh, Nicole, yep. Liam Seward, Nav, Victoria Rangel. Great. Okay, so we're just missing Luke, who I believe is quarantined. Um, questions for me. Uh, um, Luke Park is out of room. We don't, Luke Park is not here, right? I'm not being an idiot. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we're here to talk about getting good. Before we before we get into talking about so this this the goal of this is I'm not really gonna be very granular. A lot of these other electives are gonna focus a lot on like particular skills or particular like what do you put in the QAC, or, like how do you extend the theory argument, how do you make a particular argument in the best way possible. This elective is not really going to be about that and is instead going to be just like the most zoomed out view possible where we're gonna try to figure out what separates debaters who are good from debaters who are great and what separates debaters who are great from debaters that are transcendent. So before we get into that discussion, I think it's fruitful to recognize that good is relative and subjective and what it means to each individual person. Ah, there we go. Now he is here. All good. Um, what it means to each individual person is different and depends on your goals. So why don't we, I'm, I'm curious to hear this from people. So like, I'm sure many of you have competitive goals from debate. How many of you care about the competitive aspect of debate? Okay, pretty much all of you, all of you. Yeah, okay. Um, how many of you have other things that you want to get out of debate? Tell me about some of those. Yeah. I mean, it's more about like the learning and then applying it to like my community. So you think like learning is just something that's inherently valuable that's like separate from the competition part? Yeah. I mean, like at least last year we could be like one up and like with the same cake as I just like it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I, that actually, that also is a separate issue, which is like making arguments that you like is something that is like separate from competition. I think sometimes making arguments that you like will trade off with being more competitive, but if you, you know, have fun in the process of making whatever argument you want, that's like something non-competitive that you get out of it. What else? Yeah. So well, research itself, like is a skill which I think is really like useful. Right? Yeah. So like getting practice that skills that you think are important. Yeah. What else? Yeah, like I agree with the research, but I think also like the ability to learn about like uh, like current events and 
I mean, specifically at this name of how it could learn more about like, international application, international law. It just sort of expands your knowledge and expands your horizons. And then I feel like also, um, like, uh, this, there's sort of like a friendship atmosphere that comes out of here, but it's like a social atmosphere where people share common interests, which I think is good. Social atmosphere, sure. What were you going to say? Cool. Yeah. Oh, like being able to like develop persuasive statements, so, like thinking on the spot and like, uh, like constantly defending different arguments that you might like believe in. Sure. How many of you all have like teams that you all are helping to maintain or that you hope to carry on into the future and novices that you like working with that you want to be good in the future too? Yeah, I think those are also like non-competitive things that you're getting out of it. Um, the, the point being, there's a lot of things that people get out of debate. And so while a lot of what I'm going to focus on in the next little bit is going to be focused on improving yourself as a competitor, I think it's important to recognize that ultimately everything is better when it's balanced. Like as everything else in life, you know, you have competing things. If you are a maximalist, there's always going to be trade-offs involved. And if you spend like all of your time focusing on this one thing that comes at the expense of other things that are also important. So I just wanted to kind of start with that caveat to bracket that off so that we don't forget about the fact that while we are all here to compete, there are other things that we should not forget about. And there are ways to kind of take it too far. Um, okay. So I'm going to go through this as a semi disorganized pile of principles to keep in mind and through which to filter your overall outlook on improving. Uh, broadly, the uniting theme behind all of this is that getting good is not about the product, but about the process. Not about the product, but about the process. The reason I think that's important to emphasize is that the product is not always something that you can control. There's a lot of things that go into the product, but the process is something that is always under your control. It's a choice for you have a certain amount of time, you have a certain amount of energy, you have the ability to decide how you spend that energy, what you invest that time in doing, and becoming better at allocating that time and energy is a process that you can consciously think about in a conscious un, in which you can consciously in a process in which you can consciously improve. Um, whereas outcomes, they're subject to lots of stuff. They're subject to, you know, maybe you got unlucky and you got paired up against a team that was just way better than you early on in the tournament or like earlier than you expected. Or maybe you got a judge that you didn't love or that you don't perfectly know how to adapt to, right? So there's lots of stuff that we can't control. So a better benchmark for whether we're improving is focusing on the process rather than the product. Okay. The first and most important principle of self-improvement is that it is important to be honest. It is important to be honest. I think there is an active dimension to this as well as kind of a more passive one. The active dimension of honesty has to do with when you're deluding yourself. Um, how many of y'all are rising seniors or you're like going into your fourth year of debate? Juniors? Sophomores, so a couple. So uh, it seems like, so, you know, you all are spanning kind of every aspect of this. And I think if you all have been at this for a little longer, you probably will have more context for the thing I'm about to ask, which is like, if you look back over your debate career, how many of you can think of a time when like you did something that at the time you thought was really good, but in retrospect, you realize it was bad? If you're a senior, like every hand should be up. Like everyone does insane things as novices. Like everyone does things as novices that, you know, you look back and you regret later on. An important part of being honest with yourself is recognizing that actually you're still kind of in that spot. Like if you continue doing this for, you know, many of you have been doing this for three years. If you did it for six, you would be looking back on a lot of things you're doing right now and you would be thinking, wow, those things were not very good. If you did it for 10, you would be looking back on things you did at the six year mark and be like, wow, a lot of that was really stupid. I can tell you that as a person who has been doing this for nearly 10 years and like looking back at things that I was doing as a rising senior in high school, there was a lot of stuff that I thought was really, really smart that was actually just awful. I mean, at one of my at one of my senior year tournaments, like our entire approach to debating decay was like we wrote a one AC that was like about water wars, and every two AR that I gave was just this like graphic rant about like how it feels like to die of dehydration. I like spent like three minutes of speech time being like, 
your cells shrivel up and your like throat parches over and it's like it was insane it like we won a couple of debates miraculously i have no idea how looking back this was like completely deranged i have no idea how anybody ever voted for this but like at the time i thought i was like oh man i'm being so persuasive like the judges are loving it people were like rolling their eyes at me and i was like nah they just like they're just haters like you know right so delusion in the moment or like overestimation of how good you are overconfidence in the amount of information that you have is a big barrier to self-improvement i'm sure i was getting a lot of feedback in the moment that it was like hey this is really bad you shouldn't do this but i just was not paying attention to or incorporating adequately because i was so confident that the thing i was doing was right after all i have three whole years of experience under my belt it's like no three years of experience is very little in the grand scheme of things and a lot of people around you have way more experience than that a related phenomenon to this is groupthink who's heard the term groupthink before yeah tell me about groupthink what does it mean um you kind of like kind of just like group into one idea because the people around you like confirm it further confirm like what you already do. Yeah. So a lot of times, you know, you get you get partnership group think, you have like team wide group think. There's even debate community group think. Like there's there's whole eras of like past debate where, you know, we look back sitting here and we're like, wow, you know, actually just reading the Owen 2002 card in response to the security K and saying nothing else was like not very good. Like that thing that everyone did for like three whole years of college debate, just like the highest levels of debate were just people doing this over and over again. It's like, that was, that was pretty bad. Like we can look back on that and realize that now sitting here as we've like thought through these arguments more. Um, but groupthink uh, causes a common source of overestimation because you're surrounded by people who share a lot of the same assumptions as you, you know, a lot of you all are friends with people on your team. And so you talk to them about debate a bunch, you exchange your views. And over time, the risk is that that results in kind of a convergence to a set of shared ideas, which over time, because you share them, do not get scrutinized as often as they should, or do not get revised as often as they should. Uh, you know, this this can stem from those basic things like, you know, you went to a camp and that camp released a set of arguments and maybe their version of one argument or another was not very good. Like that, that camp's version of that file just like turned out to be bad. A form of groupthink that's pretty common is that people will look at that camp file and be like, hey, this camp file sucks, therefore this argument must be bad. When in reality, a lot of the times there's lots of factors to take into consideration, like maybe you know, the, the people who wrote that file were less experienced, or maybe the way that they, you know, an early decision that they made with how to write that file or how to execute that strategy just locked them into something suboptimal. And so they made that file worse than it had to be. On the arms sales topic a couple of years ago, the finals of the TOC was won on a drone exports app that every single camp decided was just terrible because the fill-in just had destroyed it. And that didn't have to be true. The team that broke the SAF MBA, like rewrote the app and like made some adjustments, but a common form of groupthink, and this is a good example, is just like, you just look at the files that are in front of you and you think, oh, this must suck, when in fact it doesn't. Similar examples have to do with preseason prep. You know, you're talking to your team, you think like, here are some good arguments, here are some bad arguments. You talk yourself into these decisions and they might be bad, but because there's no source of feedback from inside your team, you don't really scrutinize those decisions enough. So, how do we counteract groupthink? We need external sources of information. We need people to challenge our beliefs for us. What are some external sources of feedback that we can use to push back against groupthink? Yeah. Coaches. Coaches. Say more about that. How do you use coaches to push back against groupthink? Well, I feel like, I mean, at my school, we, we do like, we do drills for our coaches and we like incorporate them and provide them both the teacher and if you we could have been writing arguments with like our partner and thought, mm -hmm. oh, this argument is really good. And the coach looks at the argument and is like, well, actually, like the link to this disadvantage is just like false or wrong. Mm -hmm. and you think about it and you're like, oh yeah, in retrospect, that argument is probably false. And then you like don't like you save yourself from reading disadvantage and on around where like you probably could have read before you when you win and like it said loose, but if you had a dumb disadvantage. Sure. Yeah. So in their best form, what you're kind of describing, this is like a, a great example of what coaches at their best can do is you like do a bunch of prep, you like write a bunch of blocks or you write an argument, you bring it to them, you give a speech. You're like, hey, does this make sense? The coach gives you feedback. They're outside of your friend circle. So they're like a valuable external source of discussion. Great. Who doesn't have a coach? 
Everyone has a coach. Nice. Who has a bad coach? Love it. So what I was going to say is if you raised your hand for either of those questions, I was going to make fun of you because in fact, even a coach that you think is bad or even a source of external information that you think is like not giving you the correct answers to a lot of your questions can be a source of external confirmation. Um, I'm sure this will come up as I ask the next question, which is judges are obviously a good source of external feedback. How many of you have had a bad judge or a bad RFD? Uh-huh. So when you're confronted with a bad source of external feedback, with some people, it's a coach that's like an English teacher and doesn't know anything about debate. For others, it's like, oh, I showed up at a tournament and got judged by a parent. You have two choices for what to do with this information. One choice is to write it off and be like, you know, screw them. They're the worst. They're an idiot. I'm just like so much better than them. And they like don't understand the brilliance of my argument. And they have nothing to teach me. So I'm moving on from here. Whatever. It's fine. The other choice is harder. It requires more work on your part, in part because when I say that everyone can provide a useful source of information, I don't necessarily mean that every single person you interact with will be able to directly teach you stuff, like tell you, here are the four things you need to do better, and then you can just do those things and improve. For a lot of sources of information, it requires more active work on your part. So when you get a bad decision from a parent, the other option is to look at what information is laid out in that decision and try to make as much use of that information as you can. What kind of information can you get out of a decision from a parent about a policy debate? What do you think? Yeah. Like they vote on who made them, who sounded better, like who made them feel better. Yeah. Or like an impact that they like, so like an impact that they kind of like felt resonance with. So like if you read an impact about global warming and they're like, for example, like a scientist or someone with like delta the ozone there or something, mm -hmm. and they're gonna be like, oh yeah, I resonate with that impact. Or like also the thing about policy debate is sometimes the impacts are a little out there. Uh -huh. And so like the idea of reading the impact of parents about like, oh, regulating like AI or like re like amending article five of NATO is gonna cause like massive war between is gonna prevent like massive war between like Russia and China, or like Hungary democracy is key. Like those arguments seem a little far fetched and out there. So sometimes they'll vote on the arguments that like make the most sense. Yeah. So I think you've made a ton of good points there. One that's often overlooked is that parents, you know, people are experts in more things than just debate. Like I know it's like people show up to debate and like they're experts in debate. And so you think that they can give you good feedback. But like, yeah, a lot of parents are just like they have careers, like they do things with their life, they read, they generally have raised debaters because random parents generally don't come up to, but like they, they're they raising a person who is intellectually curious and like interested and invested enough to do policy debate, which implies a certain amount of curiosity from the parents as well. Like generally these are pretty smart people. These are not like idiots who are showing up. They're just like people who have other sets of priorities or other sets of bubbles where they are experts and intelligent and good at what they do, right? But that doesn't necessarily translate directly into what you're doing. So that translation can be done by you, right? Maybe they just know a lot of information about this area and you can ask them like, hey, what's, you know, what are some of the, some of the facts about this? Like, what's, you know, you can teach me some stuff that's like factual substantive information about the area. Another issue is adaptation, right? So how do you convince a parent that an AI impact is a problem, right? Do you focus on Terminator, right? Or do you focus on a more plausible explanation that starts with, the ways that the parent is seeing their lives and their day-to-day -day influenced by AI and build out your impact explanation from there, right? Do you sound good? Do you use your voice as a tool to keep the person engaged, right? Those are pieces of feedback that a parent is very well positioned to give you that are relevant to all of your debates, right? No matter how expert or fluent in debate jargon a person is, they're going to benefit from the increased engagement and the increased outreach that you can learn by talking to a parent about a decision that they gave based on their whatever limited expertise that it is. What other kinds of information can we get? How else can we get feedback? We got parents, we got, or we got judges, we got uh, coaches, what else? Yeah. Lab leaders and assistants. For sure, yeah, lab leaders and assistants and kind of a similar vein to coaches. Uh, I actually think in a lot of ways, lab leaders and assistants are more useful for a lot of questions than coaches are because of that same groupthink discussion, right? Like 
no matter how independent of a debater you think you are, a lot of what you learned about debate came from the people that taught you the first set of things that you learned, right? Someone explained what uniqueness links and impacts were to you and the way that you thought about those concepts trickled out and shaped the way that you think about other arguments, whether you're aware of that or not. And so interacting with people who have different assumptions, who are brought up by different people, who talk to different groups of debaters about different ideas about debate theory, really, really helpful source of external feedback. What else? Yeah. Other debaters? Other debaters. Yeah, both on your team and your opponents. On your team, you can obviously do the same kind of comparison that you're doing with the coach. You wrote a file. It's like, hey, buddy, does this make sense? Right. And if the answer is no, again, you have those two choices, one of which is you're obviously an idiot. And the other one of which is, hey, like maybe even, you know, if I wrote this link block and like even this person who talks to me all the time is aware of how we think about debates with whom we like share a vocabulary and an experience of debate, if like even they don't understand it, maybe I'm going to have some trouble communicating this to a random judge. Right. Useful source of feedback. What else? Let's think outside the box a little bit. I'm trying to like, I'm trying to get you to realize that like you have way more sources of information than you probably are even aware of. Yeah. I guess it's kind of dependent like on the case or something you can ask like say like a friend or someone from a different team. Friend from a different team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah. So like an external source of feedback, but like still from someone who's fluent in, in debate. I just even brought like how many of you have talked to a teacher about a debate argument? Like someone who has no experience in debate, just like go to your social studies teacher. What is neoliberalism? Right? Has anyone done that? Yeah, what's an argument you talked to a teacher about? So, we used to be like a debate coach in the 90s, but like I think it was like freshman year asked him about like answering Rorty something. Answering Rorty, I think that's the name of the author. Oh, Rorty. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so like if you, you know, a lot of concepts in debate are based on this like broad philosophical tradition that a lot of like quote unquote lay people will have way more ability to tell you about than someone who's a debate expert. I bet you go up to like 90% of debate judges and they will not be able to tell you anything about like the classical American pragmatist tradition. Uh, whereas a social studies teacher might be able to get into the meat of like, what does Rorty say about framework? What does Dewey say about, it's like all of those, you know. So yeah, that's a great example. What else? Yeah. Um, I would ask like our AP Gov teacher about different like methods for how the government works, like for course tasks or like course tracking. I would ask how that works and if you think like like the Roe v. Wade case, like if you thought it would get overturned based on release. Yeah, so I think asking people what they think is is useful. I think a common trap that people fall into when talking to like outside sources or outside like experts is to just ask them what they think. Just asking them what they think can be useful in the sense of it can like give you good feedback on like whether the thing that you're saying is baseline and reasonable. But I think even more useful is asking people like that why they think those things. And that can help you for the reason of giving you tools to explain the arguments in a debate. But also, this is just a generally very useful question to ask anybody that you ask about any belief. Like a lab leader tells you something. Why do they think that? Or a judge tells you something. What led them to that conclusion? Or again, social studies teacher, like maybe you're asking them like, is Roe v. Wade gonna get overturned? Why do you think that? They might tell you some news sources that are worth following along that gave them that useful source of information. They might share a broadly pessimistic outlook on the trajectory of the Supreme Court that might tell you a little bit something about the vibes the judges are going to respond to your argument with. They might tell you something about, you know, just the, the kinds, of, uh, kinds of information or the kinds of predictions that are useful to make as a political activist rather than not useful to make as a political activist. So point being, lots and lots of ways to get feedback on this issue. I think to round out this conversation about honesty, one of the most important things to keep in mind, and we'll circle back to this, is the role of ego in being honest with yourself. And by ego in this context, I don't mean like having a bloated ego or like having a super inflated sense of self-worth, like you think you're the best. Although some people do, I think, have that impression. Um, you know, the stereotype of the douchebag debater does not come out of nowhere. Like there's certainly some, you know, people were like, if the shoe fits. But what I'm talking about here is not like you think you're God's gift to debate, but rather that you think that your self-worth or you think that your value as a person is somehow linked to how good of a debater you are. The reason that kind of thinking gets in the way 
is that it makes it hard to be self-critical because when you are being self-critical, it, it makes you kind of think that, you know, if people are giving you feedback, it makes you feel like you're being attacked as a person. Or if you're criticizing yourself, it makes you, you know, it makes you want to look away from your flaws or like just focus in on things that you're already good at and like revel in the things that you're already proficient at rather than like looking at the points where you're really deficient and you need to improve, right? Finding self-worth in things that are not your skill level and are rather, again, this process over product thing, right? Finding self-worth in debate is fine, but it should be focused on things that you can control and it should be focused on things that are your choice. All that you can control at any given point is, again, how to spend the limited time and energy that you have available to you. And if you're making the best choices for that, you should be proud of that. If you're thinking about improving the way that you make those choices over time, that should be a source of pride for you. What should not be a source of pride for you is, I wrote my conditionality block and it is perfect and nobody can tell me otherwise. Because then when somebody tells you otherwise, you start thinking to yourself like, oh, this person is attacking me or, oh, I'm a piece of shit because like this thing that was the source of all my debate value is actually like, you know, it's actually, it actually sucks. Like this person that I respect has told me that it's terrible. Both of those are bad extremes. You know, the conditionality block you wrote, it's the product of a process. If that process was good, you should be proud, but you should be willing to revisit what your conditionality block when somebody tells you that it needs improvement. Does that all kind of make sense? Related note, and this is kind of an even more zoomed out thing rather than any particular you know, source of information, is that you should assume that others know things that you don't. And when you interact with people in debate, you should act accordingly. That assumption will not always be true. There are, in fact, people in debate who are not as useful sources of information as other people, right? Like I said, there are going to be people that you interact with in debate. Like if you teach a novice, the novice is not going to tell you, your advice is bad. Here are my three points of actionable feedback, right? You're going to learn in other ways from your interactions with a novice, right? You're going to learn about hey, this way that I explained this argument didn't land with a person who is not fluent in debate vocabulary. Let's see if I can take another crack at it and do it differently. Or like, where did I lose this person? Where's my explanation suffering, right? So the reason it's better to approach things in this way is that even if it's not 100% right all of the time, it will be right more often than not. And the reason is that debaters are smart. We are in a very, very intellectually driven community, and the vast majority of people have something to teach you cumulatively, like even in this room, you know, you all have not, you know, some of you have varying levels of experience, but like cumulatively, if each of you looks around, you there are orders of magnitude more hours spent by other people in this room thinking about debate rather than by you, no matter how experienced you are, right? Like cumulatively, all of you have way more debate experience than I do, right? And so, you know, if I'm talking to one of you, the odds that one of you can be like, these things that you have said are wrong, like might not be as high, but like cumulatively, there is assuredly a lot of things that the people in this room have to teach me, right? And the same is true for you, right? Whenever you interact with a group of people in debate, those people have way more cumulative experience than you do, and assuredly you have something to learn from them. Have we heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? Is that a term that's familiar to people? Yeah, you're nodding. What's the Dunning-Kruger effect? It's just like people who know like the smallest amount of topics think they know the most. People who know the smallest amount of topics think they know the most. Yeah. There's a good, I'm gonna put away faster than notes here. Um, yeah, so the, the idea is this. So there's a chart. <laughs> This axis is confidence, and this axis is competence. That's just competence. Pay no <laughs> Ignore that. Um, and the idea is, you know, you start pretty low. You're pretty incompetent. You know that you're incompetent. This is like you show up to day one of novice practice. Then you like go to a bunch of tournaments as a novice, you like win a bunch of novice tournaments and you're like, oh yeah, I fucking kick ass. <laughs> and then, you know, this is this is what we call the uh, peak of not stupid.
And then you get to JV. And then you're like, oh, you, you know, you have some debates, you're like, maybe it's not going so well. Then you get promoted to parks and it's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> you're, like, you're like taking a bunch of L's. This is called the, uh, the Valley of Despair. And then the idea is over time, you get gradually better, and as your confidence increases, you climb the peak of the, what was it? Hang on. You climb the slope of enlightenment <laughs> until you reach the plateau of sustainability. Um, but yeah, the idea is if you think that you are really, really good and you have stuff under control, I have bad news for you. You're probably somewhere here. And that's not a dig at you. This is, you know, it has a name and it's like a well-described effect precisely because this is just a natural part of the learning process. Like, this is what happens when you learn a little bit about a thing. And then this is what happens when you learn more about that thing and realize how much more you have left to grow, right? So this is a sign of progress. Like if you're in a valley of despair and you're like looking out in, at the vast gulf between where you are now and the debater that you want to be, and you realize how massive that gulf is, that is a sign of growth. That is a sign that you're doing things right and you're applying the right kinds of self-scrutiny to yourself, right? But what that also means is that if you're here, then that is a good sign that you're missing some pieces and you should assume that there are unknown unknowns out there that once you figure them out, will bring you down to here. And this is also not a global picture. It's not like all of debate is like a unified thing where like all of your debate skills grow and you climb to Mount Stupid and then you like plummet, right? There are lots of individual skills in debate where this also applies. You know, you think you're the best politics uniqueness debater in history, and then all of a sudden you're not. Or you think you're the best at framework ever, and then you debate a team that like has thought about something that you didn't before, or you get curb stomped, despair, right? All of these things happen individually. So if you feel confident in a skill, there's a good sign that that means, or there's a good chance that that means that you actually know less about it than you think. Over time, if you are doing debate right, your confidence about your knowledge and things should go down rather than up is I think the broad takeaway from this. some issues there are so clearly correct answers that you will eventually gain the confidence to say like okay plateau of sustainability like I'm pretty sure like this is the correct conclusion but like I spent a year researching nuclear no first use it was my app the last year of debate that I like wrote an app for myself I have no fucking clue if no first use is good or bad right like I think it's good the cards seem to suggest that it's good very few people successfully demonstrated that it was bad when I was saying that it was good. But like a lot of smart people think that it's bad. Like those smart people have thought like way longer about this issue than I have, right? I'm like more confident about that issue than about most things. But still, like if some if it turned out that it was bad, that would certainly not be earth shattering for my worldview, you know? And that's the kind of lens that I think that it's useful to apply to a lot of other things in debate as well. All right. Questions about that set of stuff or thoughts? Okay, um, on the subject of the gulf between you right now and where you wanna be is very, very large. The way to deal with that that I think is most helpful is to break down that gulf into to-do lists and action items. Big problem, I'm not as good as I want. Smaller problem, when I extend the K, I often lose. Smaller problem, when the app makes a framework argument that I haven't thought about, I tend to like repeat myself a bunch because I have no idea what to say. So this small problem that we've narrowed down to is only a tiny component of what contributes to the big problem of you're not as good as you want. But it's also much more manageable. Like once you've, you know, there's a, the big problem of like, I'm not as good as I want. You can't design a drill for that. There's nothing you can really do that is clear, that is suggested by identifying this problem. But once you identify the narrower problem, like let's say you are just like really inefficient and repetitive when you're debating NEG K framework, what's something you could do? Like even without your coach, 
Just like, what's the thing you can do about that? Any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, so like you can make your blocks more efficient. You can think through more stuff, like more things that you haven't answered before. Uh, what about, you know, let's say you loop in a coach. Let's say you like loop in a friend. What can we do then? Yeah. If they're part of the debate, you can like watch them do framework and like teach them on how they do. Sure, watch them do framework. Maybe get someone to design a drill for you, right? Even if that person is not more experienced than you, right? Having someone external design a drill for you where they just like list a bunch of app framework arguments and you practice going through them in as efficient of a manner as possible or someone else brainstorms what you need to answer and then you go through and write those blocks. Those things can be helpful because again, they provide that oh so important source of external information and knowledge. Um, okay. One thing that I will say about identifying action items and distilling these complicated big problems into smaller problems is that your action items should be context dependent. Let's say you show up to your first tournament, you've written an AF, your judge round one is like this advantage one that you put in your AF is an atrocity. It makes no sense. I cannot imagine anybody voting on this. You can't really rewrite your case before round three or whenever your next app round is, right? Like probably. It makes little sense to spend your time thinking about that aspect of the problem now that the tournament has actually started. Certainly fix that for next tournament, but for now, let's say your advantage one is terrible. Like what are some things you can do to adjust for that? Yeah. You can like write out what, cause I feel like it's easier to write out like case arguments for the advantage one. If they make like strong arguments against advantage one, you can like block out advantage two if you don't even have to for that. Yeah, there you go. So easy solution, go for advantage two, make advantage two way better, right? Um, maybe you need other sources of offense, so maybe straight turn some stuff. If advantage one was what you were using to get solvency deficits to a set of counter plans, and advantage one turns out to suck, maybe go for theory if they go for those counter plans. Maybe read some add-ons because you don't have enough sources of offense in the one AC, so you got to add on some more. Yeah. Would it be feasible to like potentially if in like your second advantage, if you were to add like one more scenario and like completely scrap the first advantage and then just make like one big advantage? Yeah, if it's extreme enough and you already have the prep tools, yeah, that's certainly a thing that you can think about. I guess the bottom line though is that's obviously not a good long-term solution, but the things that you can do to remedy particular problems are situational. And so thinking about what you can do in the moment, given the path dependence that's been created by your past decisions is a valuable way to think about the issue. Okay. Next big idea is that the buck stops with you. Has everyone heard the phrase, the buck stops here? This is supposedly a thing that, or do you know the phrase passing the buck? Like, I'm not responsible for this. This is someone else's problem. I'm passing the buck. Um, I think it was on, was it on FDR's desk or something? There was a plaque that said, the buck stops here. It's like, once the buck gets passed to me, I'm not passing it off to anybody else. I'm solving this problem. The point of the phrase is, Stuff is your responsibility. Like when you go into a debate, it doesn't matter if it was your partner's job to update politics and they didn't update politics. It doesn't matter if your coach's job was to fill out the prep sheet and they did a really bad job and so you have a terrible judge now. It doesn't matter if your opponent is a school that has 20 coaches and you only have a couple of coaches and they have way more cards than you and have out-resourced you. Those things impact the debate, but it is still ultimately your responsibility, given the situation that you're in, what to do with the situation and the tools that you've been given. That's not to say debate's fair. As I just alluded to, a lot of things in debate make it unfair. But that is a problem for us to work on collectively as a community. It is not a problem for you to think about as you're standing up to prep your 2AC or give your 2AC in a debate in which a lot of things are stacked against you, right? Those thoughts are not useful because the conclusion of those thoughts, if you were to accept them, is that there is nothing I can do other than accept my inevitable loss and then grumble about it and complain, right? Those complaints are oftentimes legitimate and worth making, but they are not worth making in the context of maximizing your win percentage in the situation that you're in. There might be 20 levers in any given moment that you cannot pull. They're out of your reach. Those levers might be what budget your team has, 
how much resources your opponent has, how good your prefs are, how good the pool is, how diverse your argument set is, right? You can't pull those levers in the moment necessarily. But for every set of levers that you can't pull, there's always something that you can do to influence your vulnerability to that situation, your exposure to the variable that is a problem, right? Let's say you're debating a school with lots of resources and lots of prep, and they've written case next to everything, right? They've written case next to all the core apps, right? Write a small app. Write an app that forces them to go for T or to go for a process counter plan. Then practice the shit out of debating that T argument and that process counter plan, right? Those might not be the best choices for someone else, but they might be the right choices for someone who is not capable of keeping up with updating 60 sets of two AC blocks over the course of a season, right? If someone's better than you and has written a case next to everything, break a new app. If you can't write case next to every position, reduce your threat level from new 1AC sources of offense by writing a topic K that lets you use framework to screen that stuff out, by writing a process counterplan that makes the 1AC irrelevant, by getting good at T to police the boundaries of what the other side can do, right? These are all more useful choices that you can make given the set of constraints that you're in. And those choices are not always going to be visible to you. So this links up with being honest and seeking out external sources of feedback, right? If you do not see a way to exercise your leverage on that situation that is in front of you or on any given situation that you're in, that is a sign that your problem solving mechanism needs to be improved. Your problem solving mechanism or your process of discovering ways to affect situations is a skill just in the same way that writing to AC blocks or thinking through debate strategy is. So taking responsibility for the stuff that you can control and turning those things into action items is better than resigning yourself to the fact that lots of stuff is outside of your control and therefore you're just doomed. My next theme is something that those of you who are coming from GDS will find familiar. It is do things for reasons. Do things for reasons. The alternative to this, of course, is to do things for no reason. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, obviously you wouldn't wanna do things for no reason, but a lot of you do things for no reason all the time. Has anyone ever told you you gotta read cards in the 1AR? Who has read cards in a 1AR just because they have been told that they have to? without a particular goal or purpose. Or like you're extending arguments on the case and the block. You've been told you should read more cards on the case, right? How many people have read more cards on the case just because they heard the acronym extend or like extend, what's the ear? Extend, argue, read or something? Extend, argue, like, extend, argue, read, I think is what it is. Yeah, because like you extend your original argument, you argue with their responses, then you read more cards. It's like, oh, it's the acronym. So I've got to read more cards, right? That's an example of doing things for no reason. Somebody told you, you never thought about it. You're just reading a new card because the acronym said so. And the acronym gives you the rules. So you follow the rules, you read more cards, right? In debate, there are trade-offs to everything you do. Your prep, every card that you read is a card you could have read elsewhere. Every strategic choice that you make is trading off with other strategic choices. Every conditional counter plan you introduce is increasing your chances of losing to theory. If you read DDEV or done their impact turn, you're trading off with your ability to say things that contradict that turn, right? There are trade-offs in everything that you do in debate. So when you do things for no reason, you are trading doing something for no benefit when just like every, everything else that you do, that thing inherently trades off with doing something else. And that thing would have a benefit. So if you're doing things for no reason, right? You're, there are these hidden trade-offs at play that you just have not think about, thought about and not analyzed. Now, again, many of you are at a point in your debate career where like, if you decided to figure out the reasons for everything you were doing, you would fail because you do not completely understand the reasoning behind everything your coaches are telling you. So this is not to say ignore your coaches and try to derive all of the best practices of debate from, from the ground up. Rather, it's a reason to ask. You're told by a coach, read more cards in the 1AR. Why? Their answer to that question will reveal what the goal of doing that strategic move is or that tactical decision is, and it will let you later on think about what the point of it is and when that is actually a bad idea, right? It might tell you, oh, actually in a framework debate, a lot of times it's not that helpful to read extra cards. Or like in a K debate, 
a lot of times in the one AR, when you read extra cards, it's trading off with explaining your two AC cards, which would be way, way more valuable because the, the K argument hasn't really evolved in the block, right? When you ask yourself the purpose of these things, you can make decisions in a way that's informed by what you're trying to actually accomplish rather than just doing things because someone told you to do it. The last bucket before we do a little bit of questions and musings from you all is that it is important to take care of yourself and to take care of others around you. If you ask someone who was around when I debated, they will tell you that I was not the best at practicing what I preach on this front, especially on the taking care of myself front. Like I was not, like I did not have a very good sleep schedule, but as someone who has come out on the other side of that, I can also tell you that looking back over my debate career, there are many, and I mean many losses and near losses that are directly attributable to the fact that I did not get enough sleep or I did not eat food and I was hangry instead of looking at a situation like rationally, right? Many, many specific examples. Like I could go into more detail about this if, if you want. The one that I'll, I'll give is like, I nearly lost an NDT semis debate because after the octafinals, my coach came up to me and was like, hey, Kansas broke this process counter plan. I can spend the rest of the day answering it. Do you want me to? And I told him, no, fuck off. Don't want that. I wrote an app. I'm pretty sure it like beats the strategy. Don't care. We get to the semis. Kansas reads this process counter plan. I look at my pile. I realize, A, I have not made a 2EC block. B, my pile completely sucks. Kansas agrees that it sucks. It's the entire 2NC. Luckily, they read a new impact in the 1NR. We kicked the app. We like impact her in the dis ad for five minutes. And like, it was fine. But like, my God, if they had not read a new impact, I would have felt so stupid if I lost to this thing that my coach was like, hey, do you want me to work on this for 10 hours? And I was just like, no, because I was like tired. I hadn't slept for the three weeks before the tournament and I was delirious. And like, I don't know. But you understand what I'm saying. It's like, there are many, many examples of this kind of thing. And most of them will not be as direct as what I'm describing. Like, have you heard the phrase debate is a game of inches? Like it's all, you know, you're, you're eking out like incremental benefits or advantages. Sleep and rest and food really matter at those margins. And the other thing that I'll say about this is that solving this problem is a form of prep. Like how many of you all don't eat at tournaments because you're stressed out and when you're stressed out, you're not hungry or it makes you nauseous to eat that, all the time. This Like I was terrible at eating at tournaments for this reason. S finding a source of calories that you can consume during a tournament without feeling nauseous is prep. It is as important as writing a 2AC block. It is arguably more important because the systemic effect of having nourishment Will, be, will benefit you across way more of your debates than having a particular 2AC block to an argument that might not even come up, right? How long do you spend writing a 2AC block? Like on average? Yeah. Five minutes? Yeah. Five minutes? Yeah. Mm, that's probably too short to like, but like, let's say like, you know, core topic generic, you're like iterating over the course of the season. You got like, it's like the security K. Like how much time over the course of the season do you spend thinking about the security K? A lot. A lot, right? Um, more debates will be decided by whether or not you're hungry and thinking straight than by the marginal improvement in the security block, the security K block that you make. You should allocate your time and energy accordingly, like seriously. Um, my junior year, I was not doing great in terms of when I'm going into a debate that's really high pressure and really stressful, like managing the stress level and the anxiety about what is about to happen, right? I spent a lot of time figuring out a 10 minute routine that works for me to recenter myself, get rid of the anxiety, to get myself into a state where I'm ready to operate at peak performance. It involved taking a walk, it involved drinking a set of tea, I had a playlist, right? That is prep. Those things will impact you more than you realize. For every debater, it's different. Um, some of the debaters that I coached needed to go to a dark room and lie down for five minutes. Other debaters needed to go for a run. Akash, one of the kids that I coached this year, did jumping jacks. Like, it's all different. And some of it's weird. Like, people have their own weird routines and like things that help them refocus and like get to a place where they're ready to perform. But figuring that out is an important part of your broader process, I think. Relatedly, 
being nice to others. This is an investment in yourself because when you are nice to others, you foster an environment in which people are nice to you, which will help you accomplish the things that you're doing. So there's a selfish motive for this, but also obviously debate is a bunch of people and those people have relationships to you. They think of you in a particular way. You should want them to want you to win and you should want to be the kind of person that people think of positively because ultimately we're a bunch of people and that's all that this really is. And it is way better for being good if we are nice to one another as we do whatever it is we're here to do. Um, okay, those are my thoughts. Um, I hope this was helpful. Uh, do you all have musings or questions about anything that I have said? Your playlist. What's my playlist? Uh, it like changes from, it like changes pretty regularly. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big like listen to music in the background and don't pay attention to the lyrics and like have it on as a, so like usually it'll only be a couple of songs at a time that I just like play as a loop. Um, like I had a K-Flay album that I would just like, that I just like listened to nonstop for like three weeks at one point. It's just like, I don't know. But like, again, it's, re it's really all about what works for you. Like my playlist is not gonna be what you need to get you into the zone. I can maybe track it down later if you're curious. Um, yeah, other questions, thoughts? Yeah. Um, how do you like not get stressed or like, intimidated by rounds that are really important or like tournaments that have like a lot of teams that are like threatened. So part of this goes into it part of this circles back to that ego thing that I was talking about, which is like where do you find your source of self-worth and like how do you feel satisfied about what you know how you perform. Obviously it's stressful. There's like a short term like tactical aspect to your question, which is like which personally I solved it with breathing exercises. Like it was something that was really helpful for me. It was to just like go outside. The one that I found particularly helpful was uh, one that I read that I forgot where I read it, but it was called like pyramid walking. Uh, and the idea of this was like you walk and then you do inhale for a certain number of steps, exhale to a certain number of steps, incrementing up by one, going up to a particular number of steps, like 10 steps in, 10 steps out, and then go back down. Um, that was one that was really helpful for me, but that's kind of the tactical aspect of that. The broader question is like, how do you not feel overwhelmed or like, how do you not, how do you confront the risk that like you're going to lose or this tournament is not going to go the way that you think? And the answer to that, I think, has to do with taking pride, again, more in the process than in the product. Um, I think an important part that I, I maybe glossed over a, a little bit, but I, I want to hammer home, like part of the implication, like the flip side of this process over product business is like how many of y'all have been told by a coach, like you go to, you, you like have a tournament that is not, it doesn't go the way that you want. Uh, you know, you have a bad tournament. Your coach tells you like, don't worry. Like you did great. You know, your best is good enough. Like it's all fine. How many of you have been told something like that? That is a helpful thing to say in the moment, but I think it is somewhat disturbing disruptive in the long run as a macro way of looking at debate because if your goal is competitive and again we have lots of goals here so this is not to imply that your only goal should be competitive but like if you have a competitive goal and your competitive goal is to win the tournament and you did not win the tournament objectively what you did was not in fact good enough so to say that like oh whatever you did was good enough it's like that is objectively incorrect right? Because you had a goal, you did not satisfy that goal. Now, does that mean you shouldn't be proud of what you did? No, obviously not, right? What your best is, rather than good enough, is all that you can do. And if you're doing all that you can do, you should be proud of that. But part of being proud of your process means acknowledging that what you did was not good enough. And that's true even when you win. Like, I think what distinguishes the best and most, you know, most ruthlessly and quickly improving debaters that I've ever worked with was that, like, even after they would win a tournament, they would be like, all right, redo time. We, like, crushed this team in the semis, but I feel like my explanation of this chunk of the debate wasn't good enough. Here's my rewrite. What do you think? Right? Or, like, this, I mean, uh, 
I was working a lot with uh, Northwestern Dieppe over this last year. Like you would think they're like one of the best teams in the country. Like what are, you know, what work could they possibly use on fundamental skills? In the middle of the year, they came up to me and were like, hey, we feel like our impact calc is not good. We need a lot of impact calc drills. Can you like do a bunch of impact calc drills? We did like 15 sets of impact calc speeches over the course of the second semester. And it's like, you would think impact calc would be something that, that they have down, but like they, and you know, obviously they were quite good at impact calc, like in the grand scheme of things, but they were like, this is a place where we're not doing as well as we could be doing. And this is a place where we can eke out a source of relative advantage. So I guess this is all to say that like, you know, it's, you're not going to eliminate all of your stress before the big tournaments, but it, it helps to think of it in terms of like, are you doing the things that are under your control? Is your process as good as it can be? Are you asking the kinds of questions about your process that I've been highlighting over the course of this? And if you are, what you do might not end up being good enough still, but it will be your best and it will be praiseworthy and it will be worth taking pride in. And that's all that I think you can really control. Anyone else? Is that a hand? Okay. Um, yeah. I like this sleep thing. Like, how do you balance like stress and sleep? Because I always feel like like I tell myself to sleep, but then like I'm like, oh no, like, I need this like like I need to write this block, and then I like and it's like hard to like figure out when to like stop. Yeah. So. In the vein of always doing things for reasons, part of the answer to that question is contextual, right? So like whether you stay up to write that block three weeks before the tournament is a different answer to whether you stay up to write that block the night before the tournament. If it's the night before the tournament, I can tell there are, there are no rules in debate, but this is as close as it gets in my mind to one. The answer is go to bed. Like if it's midnight and it's the day before a tournament, I literally could not care less what cards you think you need to cut. Like, no, go to bed. Um, if it's three weeks before a tournament, it's like more of a more of a question. I think much like with a lot of this other stuff, a lot of the answer is, um, you know, as long as you're aware of that trade off and as long as you're thinking about that trade off and you recognize that giving up sleep is, in fact, a cost that you're paying that has it translates into competitive effects, too, then you can start to balance those things in a way that is a little bit more intelligent and intelligent and conscious of what the trade off that is occurring actually is. Um, and part of that, it's like some people just need less sleep. That's, I think, true. It's like part of it is like it depends on what age you are. It depends on like what your other, like how healthy you are as a person overall, how much sleep debt you've accrued over the past while, right? Like, I don't know. So there's a lot of context specific questions. A lot of it is like, what do your next couple of weeks look like? Like, uh, Akash. <laughs> keeps a calendar that's extremely detailed where he like knows pretty well like when he's going to do a particular set of assignments over the next little bit and so like that means I need to stay up now because I'll spend the next two days catching up on sleep and then after that I have a final and a set of midterms that I need to study for that will be stressful that'll take a while and then I can recover and then do so like in the same way that athletes often plan out like when to do a workout um, they're also facing that trade-off of like you're getting exhausted versus you're working on improving a particular physical capability, right? So I think it's a similar kind of thing, but uh, just as long as you're thinking about it, you'll gradually over time accumulate enough data about this kind of thing to make more intelligent decisions about it. And again, like with everything else, this is a thing that people that know you better can add, you know, can give you better non group thinked information about. Like your parents probably know a lot about your sleep habits. Yeah. Uh do you have tips for like when to recognize you're like burnt out and then like how to recover from that? Uh, how to recover from burnout. Um, I guess I'll say a meta thing, which is high schoolers go to too many tournaments. This has always been true. Like in college, we go to like eight tournaments over the course of the year. Um, seniors, how many turn like how many of you all have been to more than eight tournaments last year? Rising seniors. I don't know. I, I hear stories of people going to like 15 tournaments a year. And I'm like, that's crazy. Like if you go to a tournament four weeks in a row, like, of course you're going to get burnt out. There's just like no shot that you're going to avoid. Like it's, it's such a strenuous like debate. 
do, debate tournaments are not very good for your health. <laughs> like no matter, despite our best efforts, like we already surveyed, like many of you aren't eating, many of you aren't sleeping. It's like, yeah, they're very stressful. And like, you're not in exactly the most low stakes situation. Like you have things on the line, you're doing a lot of work. Like, so it, it's not surprising and it's totally normal if you do that and experience burnout. So one solution is just like scaling back the number of tournaments that you go to. Even if not the total number, increasing the spacing between the tournaments gives you a better chance to recover. Um, as well as just like, I don't know, taking a break is sometimes correct. Like, yes, it will trade off with the number of cards that you have in the short term. It might not in the long run because your burnout might make you less productive over time. Um, I think generally a good sign that you're being burnt out is there's a there's a good corporate jargon term for this, which is you know there's absenteeism, which is when you like don't show up to do a thing. There's also presenteeism, which is when you show up to do a thing and then you just like stare listlessly at your computer and accomplish nothing. It's like if you are finding yourself going to the library and like by hour three you're just like staring at the screen and nothing is happening. That's like it's time for bed. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't know. It's like, a, again, like with a lot of these things, a lot of it is about knowing yourself and knowing your, your boundaries and making choices that are informed by those kinds of things. Um, and recognizing that like, even though, you know, it's, it's natural to have limits and you will be more competitively successful if you adjust your prep in a way that is, in a way that is cognizant of those limits and responds to them rather than pretending that they don't exist. Um, all right. If you all would like to talk more about specific aspects of this or like more questions percolate up, um, I hang out in the library during the evenings, um, and you all probably have ways to contact me. So I'm happy to talk to any of you about any of this, uh, but I hope this was helpful. I know it's like, again, less, less traditional elective in the sense of like less detail about particular things that you need to do, but hopefully this like outlook and way of looking at debate questions, uh, give you some tools that are useful. All right. Thank you. Yep.